In part two of our How Habitat Helps Hunting video series, we're going to take a look at how food plots help create huntable situations. Mossy Oak Properties, where outdoorsmen find their favorite place. In our first video in this series, we looked at habitat and identified it as food, water, cover space yep. and looked at a part of my property that we made use of each of those elements within the habitat to benefit wildlife. Obviously, that's our first goal, but also how it can help us be more successful hunters during the fall. We looked at a water hole, clear cut, old field environment, how we could incorporate a food plot mm -hmm. into that to funnel deer traffic and hopefully this fall, as a result of our hard work, we'll put a nice buck on the wall. But in this part two of this series, we're going to look and focus more on food plots, how we can design food plots looking at access, entry and exit, how we can get in and out cleanly, what type of blends we can plant in a small hidey hole food plot type of situation, and how we can take a food plot, and as we mentioned in the intro, to create a huntable situation that maximizes our chances for success. As Cody mentioned, we're going to be taking food plots and just dissecting it a little bit further. And where we're standing today, I had to get blindfolded in. This is the old honey hole type of place right here. And we're gonna discuss how he created it, why he created it, and what he is doing within it. Now, right behind us is roughly an acre size food plot and very attractive. Got some great things going for it. You actually shot your buck out of it last year. And I shot a four year old eight pointer out of it last fall. And it's kind of the centerpiece of the whole property. It's the destination food source slash food plot on the property. It's in the middle. It's where we want deer to spend most of their time traveling to and from. But it's not because of the topography, because of our access, it's a very sensitive food plot where we can't really hunt it that often. We can't hunt it. We can only hunt it with select winds. So it, a really sensitive area yeah and to make that spot the best it possibly can be because you should always ask to yourself whether you're in a blind or you know looking at maps or just being a deer nerd how can I make things better yeah and that plot how can we make things better yeah we can make that food plot better by making a brand new food plot behind us which is essentially what we did and what's really cool to me is we call that food plot up there Poplar Point. It's an acre in size and it's a destination food source on this whole property. But as I mentioned, it's difficult to access, not laid out because of the topography and our access. We're limited with the winds that we can hunt. It's just a sensitive area. However, most of the deer who access Poplar Point access it from a bedding area over my left hand shoulder. So I decided to come in here, clear out this little third of an acre at the most food plot with a dozer and create a food plot here so I can essentially hunt Poplar Point without hunting Poplar Point. I can alleviate pressure off of the center of the property, the destination food source, and I created a supplemental food source, a little hidey hole kill plot right here where I'm basically essentially relatively speaking hunting the same deer while leaving poplar point leaving our main food plot untouched and keeping the pressure off of it one thing about that's nice about this spot is one thing that we should really concentrate on and we maybe sometimes don't do a very good job good job of it and guilty as charged is the in and out of it yeah. how can we access it without blowing everything you know out of it right and especially you know getting going out of the stand as well yeah the big thing with hunting food plots is it's it's a double-edged sword because given the time of year more than often you're going to see deer is it going to be the big buck that you're after hopefully but not always so you're going to see deer you're going to have enjoyable hunts but it's getting out of your stand or blind without pressuring deer, without alerting deer to your presence, which is oftentimes a tricky part of a food plot. And that's the limiting factor. That's something we struggle with with Poplar Point is getting out without knowing that deer, without deer knowing that we're hunting them. With this little kill plot, hidey hole plot right here, we have a blind over my left shoulder that I can pop in. I, it, I can access this food plot and blind downwind, no human scent is touching the area that I'm hunting. There's no foot tra traffic. I leave the area completely undisturbed and I can access it cleanly, getting in nice and clean. And then because this little food plot is so small, deer will usually filter through here on their way to Poplar Point. And by the time it gets dark, most of the deer have cleared the plot. So I can get out with most of the deer have already moved on to the destination food source. They've exited this area so I can easily pop right out the back door of the blind, dip over the mountain, get back home. And more times than not, if I haven't successfully shot a deer, these deer don't know that they're being hunted. And actually, 
to prove the point that this this uh, situation worked. Last year, you shot just two does right out of it. Just boom, and then 10 minutes later, boom, and you were right. back at the house in no time flat. And the best part about that is that it didn't affect the area, the right. main destination food plot. Yeah. You know? Now, now it's, that's a really cool point. I was just, I, I sound like a great deer hunter giving these stories. I was really fortunate last year. <laughs> As I, my first time hunting this spot, I, I shot two does within the first 30 minutes. And what's cool is we have Poplar Point, as we've mentioned, at the top of the hill. We have another half acre food plot, about another four or 500 yards to the east of Poplar Point, completely mm -hmm. removed from this little spot. And I, I shot two deer, my dad and mom came, we took pictures, we field dressed the yeah. deer, we took them out on the side by side, and there were deer in both of those food plots the entire time we were here. We were talking, we really weren't trying to be all that quiet. We were mm -hmm. celebrating the hunt. And because we designed this plot where we did, and we could access it how we did, we left the center part of the property completely undisturbed. Yeah. So with all that being said, what did you plant? What could people plant in a little hidey hole that is going to be attractive, but not too attractive? Right, yeah, you don't want this to be the main food source. You want something that can withstand a lot of browse pressure because it is so small, deer are gonna filter through here. And like I said, it's only about a third of an acre in size, so it's gonna take quite a beating. That's why we have the browse cage to manage the deer usage in the area. But we don't want this to be the primary food source. We don't want this to be the goods. We want to save that for Poplar Point for our more destination food sources. We just want something green, something attractive, something palatable. So maybe some crimson clover, oats, winter rye, winter wheat, any type of fall blend that you can put in here that's going to germinate quickly and easily. This is a difficult spot for us to get to. We don't have a lot of big equipment. We can get this plot established quickly. But the main takeaway is we just want this to be the appetizer. We want to save the main course for our bigger, more established food plots. And one thing too is just, again, thinking outside the box when it comes to this, you know, the size of it, the shape of it, it's things to all consider. Right. But adding here, Cody has, of all things, let's go take a walk over to it. Yeah. A lot of experts <laughs> use it. And that is the old scrape thing. Why don't you explain this one? Yeah, there, this, but. as we talked about in part one, it's really taking the space, taking the area that you're hunting and adding as much diversity to it. In part one, we talked about diversifying the habitat. And here, it's really diversifying the attractiveness of this huntable situation, of this food plot. The food plot is an attraction in and of itself, but because we're hunting October, November, December, that's when deer are most social and communicating the most. And we'll hang a couple branches. I call this a scrape tree. It's just an old locust post my dad put in the ground come fall. I'll put some oak branches around it and make some mock scrapes and becomes a social hub where and all deer in the woods are gonna to wanna to come and at least because of their curiosity, work the scrape, check the licking branch, that deer communicate chemically. When a deer makes a scrape, works a scrape, it's leaving a ton of information to the other deer in the area. So we're concentrating deer to this area. I'll put a trail camera over here to monitor it, to know what deer are using the area and what times of the day. But also, again, because we're hunting, it's 18 yards from my ground blind right here, which is a, an easy chip shot. The second doe that I shot here last fall was actually working a licking branch when I, when I took the shot. So it's taking the area and diversifying the types of attractiveness we have here. We have food plot, we can play to a deer's biology during the fall and get bucks to visit this scrape during daytime hours. If does are looking to, if you're looking to harvest a doe, obviously they're gonna communicate at the scrape as well, but it's just maximizing the space that you have for hunting situations. On top of all that, we got, we went over what this is, yep. what maybe you could plant, we kind of mentioned shape, but what shape do, you know, what would work in a lot of situations? Yeah. What shape did you go with? I went with an hourglass shape. And again, I wish I could take complete credit for it, but there's an enormous rock pile behind Eric. But we kind of factored that in. I couldn't move the rock pile, but I put my blind where I wanted to put it and then kind of designed the food plot in this hourglass shape to kind of neck deer down to funnel them through as tight a window as possible. We can't control where deer go. We can only encourage them to go in certain spots. If a deer walks outside the tightest part of the funnel, that's just where that deer decided to go that day. But because we designed it in this hourglass shape, we have the food and attractiveness of the food plot in that hourglass. It's gonna really funnel deer within, I think the furthest shot I have at this food plot is maybe 28 yards. So if a deer's in the food plot, 
I have her or him within range and can make a shooting opportunity if she, he or she gives me one. But the shape is important and consider it if you can. We like irregular shapes, a square food plot. If that's all you got to work with, that's fine. But try to incorporate some hard and soft edges. An hourglass shape works well in this situation because this food plot is also doubling as a funnel and there's no better funnel than an hourglass. I talked about it in part one of this series, how important wind direction and access is. And we kind of touched on it at the beginning of this video, but this is an afternoon food plot spot and we're considering wind direction first and foremost above anything else. And we're gonna hunt this. I'm facing west. We're gonna hunt it with a southwest wind, a west wind, or a west-northwest wind. That's gonna keep the wind and our face out of the food plot. And if deer are in the food plot, we're gonna be downwind of them. But hunting the wind goes beyond just wind direction. Consider your thermals. As I mentioned, this is an afternoon spot. Thermals work very in their most simplest terms. Cool air sinks in the afternoon, rises in the morning. Your thermals are gonna rise in the morning and your scent along with it. Those thermals, that air is gonna cool because it's heavier and your scent is gonna cool and drop down low along with it. When I'm hunting in this spot but with afternoon cooling thermals, and as because my blind is in this spot not only is the wind blowing this direction but because of the topography it kind of follows a little drain a little ditch right where my blind sits the air as it cools kind of gets sucked right down into the blind and then behind it so once the wind settles down here in the mountains it gets wind is almost non-existent as the thermals start to cool and we get closer to dark the thermals become the most influencing factor for a deer sense of smell so if we can get downwind and utilize the thermals as the air cools and let the cooling air take our scent further down the mountain, it's going to keep this food plot untouched. Sometimes when we talk about food plots, we always, you know, we're too worried sometimes about what to plant in that plot. That's our main focus when actually, and I try to incorporate this in my consulting, it's what you do that surrounds the food plot, the right. destination plot, the nutritional food plot, that's going to make that food plot pop, make it into what you want it to be, yeah. whether it's producing cover, producing soft and hard mass trees, putting water holes, just outside the box type thinking. But with, sometimes we don't think about putting a food plot to benefit a food plot like right. you did in this situation. Yeah, absolutely. Given our property's topography, we're kind of limited in how we can design and manipulate the habitat, especially reference food plots. I mean, this yeah. is mountain land. It's at the bottom is steep, and it only gets deeper the closer you get to the top. So we're limited in how we can design our food plots, but we're, as we mentioned, doing what we can with what we have where we are. Credit Teddy Roosevelt. And we're thinking outside the box, as you mentioned, and being creative. And like Eric said, you wouldn't think that you can accent or complement a food plot with a food plot. Yep. But that's exactly what we did in this situation. We took pressure off of our destination food plot. And as I mentioned, we're able to basically hunt Poplar Point without hunting poplar point and I mean the proof is in the freezer last fall I, like I was that. really successful as a result and hopefully we, we will be in future seasons to come but it really starts with a game plan okay. evaluating where you're at what your property strengths and weaknesses are and designing and manipulating food plots around them yeah and the only thing to make this better is just doing more chainsaw management to actually let's double down on this let's make this <laughs> plot that benefits that plot right. even better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Imagine that. Yeah, so doing some chainsaw work, doing some fire to make this even better, right. to make sure that they the flow and what this is supposed to be for actually works. Absolutely. As we mentioned in part one, it's all about maximizing your space. We, in part one, we talked about maximizing the habitat from clear cuts and old fields, water holes and food plots. In part two, in this video, it was really food plot centric and we're talking about how we can maximize this food plot to be most successful during the fall and hopefully if last fall was any indication this food plot will set us my family up for many successful hunts in the future. Masio Properties, where outdoorsmen find their favorite place.